cooking kept me a lot, kept me out a lot of bad places, kept me, kept me, kept me focused, uh, kept me structured. So being in that, being in that realm, meeting those different type of people, I don't regret anything that happened because I know it is for, it's for a purpose. And my purpose is, you know, since trying to fulfill and change people's lives every day, like, you know, with food or with just talking or just, you know, saying, hey, let's let's go to the grocery store. I'm going to show you exactly what you need to get, exactly how much you need to get. And we're going to make this meal. Hey, guys, welcome back to the podcast. I'm Craig. And if you're new to the show, thank you for being with us today. Now, if you've been listening to the show for a while, thank you for coming back week after week. Thank you for your emails, for your messages on social media, and thank you for your reviews on places like iTunes. You guys are the fuel for me to make sure I'm putting out a quality show each and every week, so thank you very much for all that love. Now, on today's show, we have Chef Tommy Fields. Chef Tommy literally grew up in the kitchen. Now, his story started in the challenging world of Detroit, Michigan, and we talk about the significant effort his mom and his grandmother took to share the important lessons of hard work and good food to keep him on a straight and narrow path. Now, ultimately, Tommy took those lessons and became a Navy chef, cooking for thousands of people and teaching young recruits how to prepare for the rigors of feeding the Navy. Now, this is a conversation about Chef Tommy's unique journey, but we also spend a significant amount of time talking about his philosophy of changing our mindset as it relates to food, and he shares his tips on eating simple, accessible foods without being restrictive. All of this is done in an effort for each of us to create healthy daily eating patterns. Now, Chef Tommy really operates at that transition point between unhealthy eating choices and those very first steps to getting on the path to better food choices. As you'll see, he doesn't promote a specific diet necessarily, he just provides real talk on real food. Now just a heads up, uh, about halfway through the interview, you'll hear a small break in the conversation. Tommy and I had some technical difficulties on the call that day, so I'll apologize in advance for that little break in the action there. But before we get into the conversation with Chef Tommy, Today's episode of the podcast is brought to you by Greater Than, the apparel company with the huge mission of showing the world that we are all greater than the challenges we might face. Visit imgreaterthan.com for their new lineup of hats, t-shirts, and hoodies, and use the code BRAVEST at checkout, and you'll get 10% off your entire order. And if that's not enough, a portion of all proceeds will go straight to support diabetes research. So visit imgreaterthan.com and be sure to use the code BRAVEST at checkout for 10% off your entire order. And now if you've been following my social media account or Greater Than's accounts, you might have noticed that there are two new hats that were released over the past month or so, and I am very proud of the co-op that we did with Greater Than, and the new Bravest Trucker hats came out simply amazing. There's a couple of choices available for these limited quantity hats, so be sure you head on over to imgreaterthan.com Look for the bravest hats and be sure to pick one up for yourself. All right, guys, let's get into the conversation that I had with Chef Tommy and how we can all eat to live. So cool. So, so Chef Tommy, I, I can't tell you how much I appreciate you taking the time to talk to me today. I've been following you on Instagram, and I've been following all the pictures of the food that you're posting. And as soon as I saw all of these recipes, and one thing that I tried to inject into the show is kind of this concept of how we go from talking about living a healthier life with diabetes to actually how we start doing stuff to lead that healthier life. And I knew, right. I knew I had to talk to you. So let me first start by saying thank you so much for being here. I truly appreciate your time and your expertise, and I really look forward to getting into it with you. Okay. That so, sounds awesome, man. Yeah. So um, so as I said, this is kind of the first time we're speaking. We've, we've been uh, kind of communicating th- through online, and I like these raw conversations because it kind of provides me with an opportunity to, uh, to really explore your background without being too biased. 
Um, right. there's, there's not a ton of information out there on you, which is cool. <laughs> that gives us the opportunity to learn more about you. Um, and as I said, another reason why I'm really excited to talk to you is because everybody on the planet has some sort of relationship with food. Um, mm -hmm. For those of us with diabetes, that relationship at times can be somewhat complicated or it can seem complicated. Um, so that's kind of what I'm hoping to dig in with you today. Very, yes. I, <laughs> I've, I've, I've I had struggles. I've had high points. And, you know, I just came to the point after doing some self-treatment on myself. And I, I just made a whole routine plan into something that worked. And it's something that's easy to stick with because as easy as it is, it's so funny, as easy as it is for people to go to Chick-fil-A, go get a 12-piece nuggets, Polynesian sauce, waffle fries, and lemonade. They don't even know the fact that they can get grilled nuggets with a salad and some fruit and be just fine. Or some unsweet tea with lemons on the side. But it's all about the routine and developing a new habit and just becoming a new version of themselves. Just a little upgrade. That's all it is. It's just about an upgrade. You know, it's interesting you say that because everybody makes <laughs> diet so complicated uh, oftentimes. And they think that change – and look, change is hard. Don't get me wrong. I'm probably, right, exactly. I'm probably the most disciplined and regimented person on the planet. And I think a lot of us with type 1 tend to fall into that category. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Uh, just it's, by, like, it's life or death. Life or death for us. <laughs> it is. It is life and death, and and then yeah. it, it becomes habit, which is which is great. And oftentimes, what I'll say, uh, I, I don't know. I have conversations with people sometimes who don't truly understand type one versus type two, but yeah. they, they're like, you know, it must be so hard for you, uh, you know. And I'm like, yeah, it is hard, but the reality is, I'm probably living a healthier life than most people are. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, yeah, because I'm I'm on an insulin pump right now, the six uh, six hundred series. Uh, before I was on the flex pins, taking the Novolog, and uh, it was it was a little up and down for me taking the flex pins. But once I got on the the pump, it kind of just really like set the standard and got me really easy and really in the routine and being disciplined. And it's easier to track your numbers and stuff like that when it's on you instead of just having you got to have it in the cold pack, have it in the refrigerator and stuff like that. So this is. Uh, elevated my experience and kind of just made it easier to adapt to this, you know what I'm saying, new habit. So Sure. Are you also on a continuous glucose monitor too? Uh, yes. So I have that as well. And I also have the, uh, what's it called? The, uh, no, let me see. It's like the little, I was about to say radar, not a radar, but <laughs> it sounds like one because it's always going off. Let's see. The sensor, sorry. You got you, yeah. Yeah, it's the sensor. So it's, it's a little different. Sometimes I could not wear it and stuff like that. You know, want like really hard activity, working out and stuff like that. But then again, it, it helps you to push to want to work harder to make sure you're the best and healthiest you can be. So sometimes I go without it, but you know, I, I always have my pump on me though. Always. Sure, sure. So you you weren't born type one. You you kind of no. became type one a little later in life, and we'll talk about that in a minute. But maybe we can kind of just rewind the clock a little bit and talk about childhood a bit. What kind of kid were you? Uh, I was a pretty, I was a pretty quiet kid. Uh, I mean, I was, I was the tallest of a lot of kids, but I was pretty much the quietest. You know, um, sing, uh, single mom raised me. Um, she worked like two jobs, post office, and she baked cakes all the time. I used to help her do it all the time. She actually taught me to be more creative. Uh, she had me. I, I used to sell candy at school, and snacks, and everything. So she, t she definitely instilled that into me. Uh, I played sports. I ran track. Uh, uh, basketball. I didn't play football till I went to uh, high school, and uh, then I went to go on to college and run track, and that was it. Uh, I was pretty, pretty squeaky clean. I don't, <laughs> I don't really get in any trouble. I was being in Detroit. That's, that's a major accomplishment trying to stay out of trouble. So I was definitely on lockdown most of the time. So you grew up in G Detroit, Detroit, Michigan. Yes, yes, sir. So Detroit, Michigan. Your mom, your mom raised you. Uh, mm -hmm. As you said, it's challenging to stay out of trouble i think just as a kid in general but especially in detroit i have to imagine it must have been pretty tough keeping yourself yeah. kind of on the straight and narrow but it sounds like you had a little bit of an entrepreneurial bug in you from a very early age too yeah my mom didn't let me sit still for too long it was just it's just when she put me in all type of clubs and like uh five and lambda and fbla and deca i was <laughs> i was a busy bee like she I was at the sports, it was extracurricular activities, and then you come home to study and do book reports and all that type of stuff. I used to hate it back then, but now it's like, oh, I see what you're saying. I see what you're saying. Now. It makes sense. That's pretty amazing. So so who you talked a little bit about kind of working with your mom as she was baking cakes on the side. Is that where mm -hmm. you kind of got the original bug for, for, for cooking as well? 
it, it was actually was her and my grandma. My uh, my grandma loves to bake. Uh, she's always teaching me how to bake. I could just sit here and watch her. Uh, she taught me how to make my first scrambled egg, and uh, um, she taught me how to she because she used to have a garden in her backyard in Detroit because she's from um, Alabama. So she taught me how to garden. I used to hate it because I was like, why am I planting grapes and <laughs> cauliflower seeds? Like this is boring. <laughs> like I want to go play basketball. She's like, I got to show you this. So you know, planting cucumbers and tomatoes. Like both of my grandmas actually. To that one's from South Carolina, the other one's from Alabama, and they taught me just the the sequence of how you can grow it, bring it to your home, and it tastes totally different. And the food, the food experiences was de- totally different. Just cooking from uh, cooking from scratch, basically just from the farm to the kitchen. So, well, that gives you a whole different appreciation for your food, also, because when yeah. for most people, food grows on the shelves in a grocery store, right. And when you get and to it, see it from seed all the way through actually picking it, it, yeah. it probably gave you a pretty decent appreciation for food in a totally different way. Exactly. And it's, it's so funny because before I was diagnosed, I was just like, how, how did this happen? I was like, I've, I've been eating pretty healthy like all my life. I've been you know, active all my life. It's just like, it, just, it was just unbelievable to me. It was, you know, just like, wow, like how does this happen? So. Yeah, I think we all question that uh, yeah. around the time of diagnosis, but you yeah, know, I guess we have to look at it in, in a positive light and, and and take out of it what it gave, what it gives us. Uh, exactly. So I think you know, yeah, I think I think it definitely happened for a reason because if it wasn't put on us, then who would who would kind of bear this burden to kind of like show people that hey, don't let this get you down, and you can push through it. We're gonna show you some other options, and you know, just just to have that that durability to be to push on, be like you know what. We got this. This is just, this is just another tool in the toolkit, basically. You know. Yeah, I agree with you. I, you know, I, I didn't spend too much time kind of wallowing after I was diagnosed, and I was diagnosed as an yeah. adult also, which, oh, okay. which maybe maybe helped my mindset because I, I, I have this question, uh, this this conversation a lot with with my guests is, you know, mm-hmm. if you're diagnosed as a child versus as an adult, what do you think would be better, quote unquote? Um, I don't mm. know. If, I don't know if either is better, really. Um, it's kind of tough. It's tough. I mean, it's tough. I could imagine being like diagnosed as a as a child, but I guess that's like how people. Some people can be diagnosed with you know they have asthma as a child, and then sometimes they might grow out of it as they get older, or they get asthma when they get older. It's a little different, but it's hard to see any child you know suffering any type of thing that's just you know they're supposed to be the most healthiest, and it's like for them to for them to have to to bear through that and go through that daily and like monitoring them daily. So you already got to monitor them enough, but now it's like. Hey, what's your blood sugar? You know, hey, we'll see today. You gotta check this and check that. Don't eat that. Don't eat this. When they're so, they're so just all over the place. Want to eat everything. So it's it's out out. In my opinion, I would say I, I don't think it's adult to be a little easier because your mind frame is a little bit more. You're more responsible, yep. and you can kind of just kick in that gear. Like, okay, we gotta. You know, I'm not <laughs> not trying to go away from here anytime soon. So let's tell me what I need to do. And let's go ahead and get it. Let's push on. Yeah, I, I typically think that the, the kids, the, the the guests that I've had and the kids that I encounter, uh, they do pretty well. Clearly, everybody has mm. their down moments and there's burnout associated with type one. I have a tendency right. to kind of gravitate towards the parents of the type ones to to see how mm. they're how they're doing because that's got to be really hard seeing your kid yeah. kid go through through that pain uh, or what you perceive as pain sometimes. Yeah. Um, uh, so. Yeah, it's never easy, but you know something. I, I think that there, as you said, there's a reason why we were the ones who were chosen. So uh, mm-hmm. we, we got to make good of good of our our, uh, our job here now. So yeah, definitely. So who was your biggest influence when you were growing up? Um, I, I say my my biggest influence was my mom. Um, she she was on she was on my not on my case, but she was really supportive as far as uh, making sure I grew up correctly and. Uh, my granddad, which is her father, uh, he was uh, very heavily in the church and stuff like that. And he also, he also uh, kind of just groomed me and just, you know, saying just kind of make sure I'm mature and you know, I'm matriculation through life and stuff like that to make sure I'm the best person I am. And everybody I encounter, make sure I, you know, what I'm saying I leave a mark on that person. Everyone you meet, you should touch. You you make sure you know you leave a mark. Like, hey, you know that guy was a really nice guy. I really appreciate meeting him. You know. So that way, you never want to burn bridges with anybody like that. So they definitely instilled those kind of those morals and foundations in me to uh, make me who I am now. So, do you hear your your mom and your and your grandfather's voice in your head when you're making decisions now, whether it's business or kind of personal decisions? Oh my goodness, I even sound like them. It's it's creepy. And I was like, how is this happening? Because I'm I'm 30 now, so I'm just like, 
dang. I was like, I sound just like that. I'm like, where is this coming from? It's just that over over pretty much training, like hearing them, hearing their voice and hearing it just instilled in you like <laughs> steel. I was just like, Oh my goodness. It's crazy. Yeah, it's kind of funny because I I remember rebelling quite a bit against, especially my dad when I was younger, and mm. I was saying I will never sound like that. And then I catch myself, especially when I'm talking to my kids. Yeah, I, I'm my dad, like a hundred percent. Like all oh, this stuff is yeah. coming out of my mouth, and I'm like, it makes sense now, <laughs> you know? Yeah, it does. It just it just rubs off because my my son uh, he be four this uh, summer, so he uh, I catch myself sounding like my mom and granddad every time. Like, hey, dude, don't do this. Hey, what you what you doing? Uh, are you studying? Let me see you later. I'm just like, oh, where is this coming from? Goodness gracious, this is this is unbelievable. I just got, I, this can't be happening. It's like it's like deja vu all over again. But you know something, they clearly did something right with you, so you're gonna pass that on to your kid too. So yeah, of course, definitely. So when you when you were little, did you wish that you had a superpower? Uh, I did wish I was uh, telepathic. I was a really big X X Men fan. And I was always like, man, I wonder, you know, I wonder what they're thinking. I wonder if I can, you know, you know, telepath and you know, stuff like that. That was kind of one of the things I always wish. I never wanted to be super fast because, like, if I knew what you was thinking, I know where you're going to be at. So that's right. Too that was that was one of the things I wanted. <laughs> so, so you went on. You said you, you ran track in college, right? Mm-hmm. So you went on to to Grambling State University, which is down in Louisiana. Yes. Um, so there's an amazing history associated with that university, unlike most, most colleges and most universities. Um, yeah. What was the driving force for you to attend Grambling? Well, the thing, the thing was for me, uh, I've been to Detroit so long all my life, and I was like, I wanted to, I was so into cooking, I was like, you know what, I want to get into hospitality. And I was like, where's the best place to get into hospitality other than the South? And, you know, I had... I had scholarships to go to Michigan State. All my friends were going there. Oh, come to Michigan State. Uh, come here. You know, go to uh, other schools. You know, in the area. And I'm just like, you know, I want to. I want to go down south. I want. I want to be warm. I'm tired of the cold. I've been here too long. Uh, went there. What, what made me go there? I, you know, I sent sent the coaches the videos, and it was funny because I tried to go there on a football. You know, I, I was six five. I was six five two thirty at the time when I was in high school. Big boy. And as a senior. I was really, really skinny to them because they wanted me to be uh, 6'5", 290, running the 4'5 down there. I was like, well, I, get, I got two out of three, but I'm not 290. So the whole summer I tried to pack on weight. And it was like, well, we can't give you a scholarship. You're going to have to walk on. But the lady, the lady from the track, and she called me. She was like, hey, she, she called my mom. She was like, hey, we're going to take good care of him. Uh, we're going to also see if he can run track. Cause like, he run track too? He was like, yeah, he run track. He went to nationals, da, da, da. And she was like, okay, well, I'm going to get him in the track with a backup scholarship and stuff like that. And I was like, they was like, can you do one event? I was like, well, I was a decathlete, so I was like, I can I can do an event or two. So uh, I did hammer throw and shot put, and it was like, yeah, got an automatic scholarship. So that was that. Them just having that, that hospitality just to call them and, like, just so informal. and just have, They talked on the phone for, like, an hour. And I was just like, you know, I wonder if I'm, I hope I get a scholarship to come down here, but. That's what really got me down there. They actually reached out and called me and just like, hey, come on down here. We take care of you. And if like your mom need anything, she can come down here. You got my number and everything. So it was really cool. That's pretty awesome. So so now I, I'm guessing that, you know, it would have been nice to play football down there. Um, yeah. It's a division, yeah. division one school, right? Yeah. Yeah, so it would have been nice to play football, but you end up getting a scholarship for track, which ultimately is probably kinder on your body too. So Yeah. Cause I didn't, I didn't really do a lot of sprinting as I did in high school. So, uh, did mostly the throwing events, the, uh, javelin, the shot puts, uh, the discus, uh, hammer throwing. Hammer throwing is like my favorite thing. It's just a lot of aggression. It's putting hammer throw. So <laughs> that was my favorite one. So you see, you see, you kind of breezed over. You said you went to nationals. Was that coming out of high school? Yes. That was, Cause I, in the so far, I, in high school, I was, I was more of a basketball like, all through my life. And then, uh, one one time in practice, uh, no, it was a game. I had went up, I went up and dunked on this guy, and my legs got took up under me, and I fell back. Boom! I was like unconscious. My mom came up there, the paramedics out there. I woke up. I was just like, "What happened?" I blacked out. Never, had, never blacked out of my life. Scared to death. I was like, "What happened?" Like, you I know, mean, I'm just in my jersey, and they're like, "What happened?" They was like, "Oh my god, you okay?" They was like, "You hit your head so hard." Like it was a huge knot. Like like another head was attached to me, and and it was like, "Yeah, you, you know, you blacked out. You hit your head." And ever since then, I was scared to play basketball. Ever since then, I was like, I'm done. Like, that's it for me. 
because I, 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 like, I feel like I broke my neck and died. Like, I'm good. So I started getting the football. And what happened in the football, I didn't play football till my sophomore year because I was too light of a frame. They wanted me to play tight end. I was like, I want to be able to play defense. And they arguing, whatever, whatever. So I was actually better at playing defense than it was tight end because I, I you know, wear glasses and I couldn't really wear contacts too much. So I was like, they just said, just hit that guy and you're fine. So I was okay. And, uh, yeah, so uh, when I, after that transition, I was going through I was going through high school just trying to gain weight, uh, trying to be stronger, be faster, and stuff like that. But track was more my forte actually because I had a coach that really worked with me. Uh, he was like, "Really, really want to be good? You got you got to come early to practice and come late to practice and stay after practice." And I did. Uh, I went to I went to nationals for hurdles and high jumping. Um, I didn't do too good in high jump, but it got me to nationals like my first first year running track. So I was like, I'm good because I mean they had a guy jumping seven foot six. I was only jumping like six three. So I was like, all right, well I did good for my first year. But it was that in me just like still a whole different love for me. I was just like, you know, I'm safe. I'm like I'm on the team, but I'm by myself. And it was just like everybody working together. It was like you pull your weight, I pull my weight, we can get this together. So yeah. Sure. It sounds like you had you had uh, these these central figures in your life all the way from childhood all the way through high school into college that just kind of help kind of pull you along and keep you going in the right path and kind of yeah. building on yourself and building your confidence and, and building your skill set as well. Um, I'm, I'm curious also, you, you ultimately left college, you, you ended up going into the Navy. Did you go to the Navy straight out of college? Well, I actually left. I left. I left a year before I was supposed to uh, supposed to graduate because I, I I fell into a, like a slight depression because my mom had got sick. She got diagnosed with uh, multiple sclerosis, and I felt like I was being such a burden on her, being so far away, and like you know medical bills and stuff like that. So I was like, you know what, I have to put this on hold for her because I'm the only child. No one else is going to call for my mom, but my mom, you know, but me. And I was like, well, I can make this decision. I think it's a better decision, and. Uh, for me, it was because in around 2008, you know, a lot of stuff happened in 2008. So um, I was kind of secure and, you know, being able to help my mom and, you know, pay off her house and get her together and be able to come visit her and stuff like that. So I, in my mind, I feel like I made the right decision because now, you know, you, in the Navy, I can kind of go back to school and go for free. So no loans. So I, was, I, got, I feel like I made a better decision. So. And you took care of your mom. How's, is your mom still, still alive now? Yeah, she's she's good. She's uh doing great with most of us, uh with MS. Um, she's she's working out every day. I call her every day. She's a morning bird like me. We get up at uh five. Well, I get up at three thirty in the morning, but she gets up at five. I call her every day at five a.m. Hey, what you doing to work out today? What you eating today? Let me see it. Screenshot it. What's going on? And I'll be on her. You know, it's, it's almost like reverse roles now. Like I'm on you now. So that's uh, great. But she likes it. I keep trying to keep her uh, motivated. You know, she's she was taking her her shots, but now she's weaned herself off the shots now from eating better. And uh, just overall, just working out and stuff like that. So I'll be on the phone with her while she's on Planet Fitness. Hey, I will run with you. We're gonna do these stairs together. We're gonna we're gonna do these sprints together. Let's go. You know, just trying to motivate her. And then like whenever I time I go home, you know, I show her different little workouts that I do and try to just keep her growing, progressing, and stuff like that. That's be- that's beautiful that you're taking care of your mom like that. So yeah. so your mom your mom uh, is is managing MS, but she had type two diabetes. Is what you said? No, 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 no. Mom, no one, no one in my family has diabetes. That's the weird thing. Oh, so the shots that you're talking about were for MS. Yeah, she yeah she had like the injections. Understood. Yeah, she had the injections. Okay. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah, no one in my family has diabetes. More like high blood pressure, you know, MS and high cholesterol. That was it. Gotcha. Well, MS uh, is 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 a, a, as you know very well. Uh, it's has its own set of challenges. That that yeah. Uh, you know, the good thing about that, I guess, to a certain extent, is it kind of waxes and wanes, and you have periods where where you might yeah. not even realize that you have MS, and you you live a a completely normal life. Um, right. but when you're in those flare up times, it is very, very challenging for, for the yeah. person and for the family too. So I give you a lot of credit, um, for taking care of your mom that way. Um, yeah, it's amazing. So. Um, so, so you end up transitioning to the Navy. You actually spend a good amount of time in the Navy. You were in the Navy for about 10 years, right? Yes. I'm still in active duty. Actually. You're still active duty now. Wow. Yeah, still active duty. Yes. Um, as a, at the time right now, I'm kind of just, uh, waiting to be processed out because I am type one diabetic and it's kind of a, kind of a sticky strange situation. You can't really go on the board ships anymore. You can't uh, go overseas and stuff like that because I'm insulin dependent and they don't want to risk the chance of me not having an insulin delivery and I die. So yeah. Of course. But, of course. But, but you, when you entered the Navy, you were not type one. 
No, it wasn't pre-diabetic, nothing. So, so let's back up for just a second. So before the mm-hmm. diagnosis, what, what was military like life for you? Did you enjoy it? Did you like the, the kind of... I, I love the Navy. Like, uh, I was stationed in San Diego when I first got in. Uh, we was going to Hong Kong. We was going to Dubai. I've been there like eight times, Hawaii, everything. Like, I had a blast. You know, I got to see these different places, try these different foods, different cultures, different scenery, you know, riding camels and watching tigers and stuff. It was crazy. It was uh, amazing. You know, and then I got staged. I was there for five years. Uh, I got offered to work in the White House or, the, excuse me, the Pentagon. Uh, but I, I had too many tattoos, so I had to get cleared. So <laughs> I had to uh, get stationed in Norfolk. So, uh, But Norfolk has treated me very well and had an amazing time and met a lot of great mentors and uh, had a lot of great uh competitions that i've done and everything like that kind of just kind of making my name for myself out here so i'm glad i came out here you know everything like i say everything happens for a reason so i'm glad i came out here because people i know that work in the pentagon is like they hate it like it sucks <laughs> like don't come here so you make the best of a situation that's just kind of your nature it sounds yeah. like so so <clears throat> so the you, you mentioned just a little while ago that you were up at like three o'clock three thirty every morning was that kind of your military training uh well no that's because I'm, I'm 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 i cook in the navy so we get up. I get up at three thirty because we got to be we got to be in the galley ready to start cooking at four thirty. So you take you know get up, get yourself together thirty minutes. Then you got to drive to work thirty minutes. Then go ahead and make sure you get your uniform ready to go ahead and start cooking, prepping, and everything like that. So you know you cook from you basically cooking from four thirty in the morning to like five thirty at six o'clock at night, just straight. So. So, so this that, that that's really interesting because I didn't realize that you're literally cooking nonstop for for yeah. all day long. So, yeah, <laughs> there, there's got to be there's got to be some sort of there's got to be a certain level of stress or pressure that you're under when you're in that type of situation. Because any any kitchen I've worked in restaurants, especially when I was mm-hmm. working my way through grad school, the kitchen is the most stressful place in the whole restaurant. Yeah. <laughs> so how, it, how how did that impact you? It is. It is. Um, I mean, as as I was a junior, I was a more junior sailor. I was kind of forced with more responsibility because I was I was a little older uh, than some other crew members. So I was kind of tasked to kind of like learn early. You know what I'm saying? Get it done quicker. Uh, it makes you move a lot faster. I tell you that uh, because when you gotta have food online, you gotta have food in the line because people don't have time to wait. They gotta get to the. They gotta get to the racks. They gotta get to their next watch. They gotta. They gotta work on planes. They gotta work on this. So you have to be. On time, ready to go, food hot, and cold food cold. Make sure everything's filled up, ready to go, so you can get them in the in the line, out of the line. So, it, it definitely it definitely trying to uh, help me put things in perspective as far as uh, time management and just being disciplined and just kind of like uh, having that uh, having that method just to madness, like you know having everything organized and being competent and know like hey, and being able to direct people and you know and train people and like hey. Don't get stressed out. This is what we're gonna do. We run out of rice. Hey, we're gonna make we're gonna make noodles. So we're gonna do this. We're gonna run out of chicken. We're gonna make steak. You know, just just having a plan, a backup plan for everything else because things happen. People run out. You make steak and crab legs. You're gonna run out. So hey, we're gonna back it up with this. Just be ready. So be prepared. That's yeah. a, that's kind of a lesson that you probably took through also to, through to your diagnosis as well. Yeah, you gotta exactly. Yeah, you gotta be prepared. Be ready. So. I always, I always bring your your bag with your your snacks and your glucose tablets and everything ready to go. So it's interesting because I, I've never been in the military. My dad was in uh, in the Air Force. Uh, okay. Way back in Korea, um, he worked oh, wow. on worked on the planes, and uh, uh, so I, I would say that I, oh. I, I never and I was never in the military, but I have a very military kind of mindset. And I think mm-hmm. that that has definitely served me very well when it comes to managing diabetes too. You have to be militant. You have to be diligent. You have, you have to, to be prepared. Um, that's what's helping us keep ourselves alive every day. Essentially. Yeah. So we have no got, choice. You got to be. If, if you're not, you're just going to be all over the place, and you're not going to have any type of progress or just management. Management. Period. Yeah. So outside of the the kitchen time with your mom and your grandma, and then kind of being uh, being literally held to the fire in in the uh, the navy kitchens did, did you did you have formal training as a chef or did all of your training come through those experiences you know i i really i really started getting more formal training when i start uh doing uh cooking on a competitive level uh that's when i started coming out here to norfolk which is about, about four four years ago uh i volunteer i volunteered to come uh, watch the chef cook and i was like his sous chef i was just watching him and i was like man this is this and uh, you know, being being in sports, I'm like I'm competitive. Like I want to get in there. It's like how do I do this? And uh, it was an ACF competition. It was against all the different branches. It's uh, it's in Fort Lee. Um, 
I watched him do it, and he was like, you know, you want to get in the competition? I was like, yeah. He was like, well, you got – I had to stay up 12 hours the whole night preparing a dish. Uh, it was it was a dessert. You know, I came, I came in third place, but in 12 hours, he was like, that was really good. He was like, you got to keep coming back and keep doing it. Uh, and hearing that first – because we had master chefs grading us. There's only like a handful of master chefs in the entire world, and they come just to critique us. And, you know, I got scolded. It was like, oh, your lava cake is not moist enough. You should have made it a little bit bigger. This is da da and it was like, oh, this is your first time competing? Oh, you're, you know, look at my rank. They was like, okay, you did pretty good. We'd like to see you next year. So I was I was like, okay, that that gave me that that nice push that I wanted. I was like, okay. I went back and I was making lava cake every day. I haven't made lava cake since, but I was making it every day just to perfect it because so many things, some of the knowledge I grasped in them at that moment, I felt like, you know what I'm saying, I like, now I, I found my passion. I was like, I love cooking. Like, you know, I, I love it. Like, you know what I'm saying? I try to, I try to think about other things. I was like, Oh, I want to go out the Navy. I, I want to do something else. Maybe I want to get into real estate. And the first thing I said, I told my mom, I was like, oh, I'm going to get into real estate. Uh, yeah, you know, I can't wait. You know, do open house. I'm going to have all the food and stuff. She was like, what? She was like, get out of here. All you talking about is the food and the setup. I was like, I was like, man, that's weird, ain't it? She was like, you love cooking. Just just cook. It's, it's, it's what you do. So yeah, it's that's kind, It's kind of cool how things come full circle, though. Um, yeah. In terms of in terms of your passions in life and how how you were brought up in the kitchen to a certain extent and now all of a sudden full circle now you're trying to share that with the rest of the world which we're, I want to get into that in a second but before we do that I actually want to talk uh, and and I don't I don't want to brush over your diagnosis story either because you were in the as you said you're still active navy you're active duty right now but mm-hmm. you were diagnosed not too long ago right yeah I was diagnosed uh, Cinco de Mayo uh, 16 2016. Yeah. So, so less than two years ago, you were diagnosed. Yeah, less than two years. Yep. What, what it was? Yeah. Talk, talk to me about the kind of the, the the days and the weeks leading up to your diagnosis. What was going on? So it was it was a really funny story, man. Uh, I was doing our PT. We was doing our PR, our annual like uh, our physical readiness test. I was running. I was running. I was doing my last exercise. We were just running our mile and a half. And you know, and I guess in Virginia they have a lot of pollen out here. So I've never been allergic to grass or pollen. Anything. I've been been fine. So I was running my last time. I was like, man, we got a problem breathing. I can't breathe. And I, I, I just like, once I got done, I just like collapsed. I was like, oh my goodness. I was like, I don't know what's wrong. I got to go to the doctor. So I went to the doctor. Uh, they was like, okay, we're going to do some x-rays on your lungs. We're going to you know, uh, give you a breathing machine. Just breathe, you know, think you got asthma. I was like, what? I have asthma? I'm like, I never had asthma before. Like, what are you talking about? And, you know, I was, I was being um, very uncooperative. <laughs> I can't tell you that. Um. Uh, so they gave me uh, the inhaler, and then gave me these steroids called promethazine. And I never had steroids in my body ever. So I'm allergic to anesthetics. That's the only thing I'm allergic to. I I took the promethazine like on Friday, on Sunday, like Monday morning. I was like urinating all over the bed. I didn't know what was happening. I, I feel like I just had a flu come down on me. I was like, what is going on? So yeah, I, I tried to man up. I like, I'll just take some thorough flu and take some take some night cool and I'll be all right, you know, but it was like, it was, it was horrible. I was like, I don't know what's going on. I'm trying to drink. I'm cause usually when you get sick, you know, you drink orange juice and, you know, drink some juice to stay hydrated. I was like, it was just making it worse. I was like drinking a gallon of it. And like, it was going right through me. And so I was, I got nervous. I was like, let me go to medical again. Just see what's going on. Um, I checked in, my blood sugar was like seven Oh eight. I was like, wow. You know, oh. they was like, they was like, what's going on now? I was like, they like, you know, your blood sugar seven Oh eight. I was like, yeah, what is that? I just like, I got the flu. What's that mean? Uh, they were like, yeah, we're gonna need you to come. You gonna, uh, we need you to come with us. Uh, so I was in EQ for like three days. They was trying to figure out what was going on with me. They was like, you know, they kept trying to say, oh, you got type two. You know, you're fine. Every time they kept giving me food, my blood sugar just jump right up, full five hundred. And they didn't know what to do. So then they they went back and talked to the dietitian and they gave me some different food without any like carbs or anything like that. And then they slowly saw my blood sugar go down. They was like, yeah, you uh, got type one. And I was like. What's that mean? I'm like, that's the good one, you know, good one, the bad one, right? It was like, uh, it's not so much good or bad, but oh, kind of the bad one. I was like, okay. So I had like a had a team of like six doctors coming in. They was just telling me, hey, you know, this type of food you're gonna eat. They really didn't tell me too much. It was just like, these are foods you eat. This is what you don't eat. You know, taught me how to use the pens, and that would just send me on my way. And from that, I was just kind of like, okay, you know, what do I do from here? You know, and I've I had to learn a lot of stuff on my own. Like I had to learn how. Like what, what made it easier for me, I guess, because we count carbs and calories and everything on our our menus and stuff at work. So it was kind of easy for me to understand it. But 
for the regular person, cars, what, uh, what, what, what's this? It's hard to understand and how fibers interact with, uh, with the carbs and stuff like that. So knowing what to eat, what you, what you should stay away from and how much you should have, understanding the portion size and stuff. It came easy to me because I work with it all the time. But for some, like for somebody else, you just like, what, what are you supposed to eat? It's hard to, it's hard to eat like that when you don't normally, when you don't normally work that way. Sure. You know what I'm saying? Cause it's like, you can go to Pan Express, they're going to give you four or five servings of rice and get a little bit of chicken, but you don't, you don't know that. Cause you're not, it's all about measuring your portions as that's, is really important. Like, uh, to how you eating your eating your lifestyle has going to be from now on, but uh, I, I did a lot of self testing on myself. Like I, my A one C was fourteen point four, and I start I start researching myself and I start self help, pretty much self rehabbing myself. Like okay, I'm gonna eat this way, I'm gonna eat this because I was like I don't want to eat nothing they told me to eat. I'm going to do this because uh, I I feel like they they telling me to eat rice and eat potatoes and stuff, but that's not. If if my pancreas is is completely shut down and not making any insulin, why am I completely putting that strain on myself? Sure. So I kind of went in like a basically, I, I guess you can kind of say keto, but I don't really have that many high fats. It was just meat and veggies, just make it simple. So uh, I I did that for like eight months, and my blood sugar, went, my A one C went out from fourteen point four to six point one in eight months. And once I got the reason, I was like, okay, it's, it worked. You know what I'm saying? It was doing good. Because I saw it gradually after every three months, I went in, went from like 14 to, to 12, and then it went from 12 to jump down to 6, and then it finally went down to 6.1. And I'm just trying to get to like 5.6 to be normal. Because uh, I want to be an overachiever, I guess, <laughs> to make sure, like, hey, I want to know no instant is here. So, uh, yeah, that, and, that, and that's how I learned. You know what I'm saying? But a lot of people are not going to put that, a lot of people are not really equipped to kind of like be able to grasp it so fast because they need something like just make it simple for me put it in my put it in front of me show me what it is and okay now i got it because a lot of people a lot of people are visual learners a lot of people is not like numbers numbers wise like okay well i gotta count these many carbs and this they, they're not gonna sit there and count carbs all day but if you tell them a certain portion size if they can remember visually it makes it so much easier for the mind to adapt because if i tell you hey man i like that red car that just passed by when you see it again like oh that's the red car i saw yesterday but if I tell you, hey, that car got 400 house, 400 house power, you got leather seats, this and that, it's harder for you to remember. Sure. But if you remember, you remember colors, sizes, and portions, you know, say, um, just shapes and stuff easier than it is to remember numbers and stuff like that, a list of things. It's of a lot course. easier. Yeah. Because if you teach it to kids, it's easier to teach to adults too. I don't know. I'm a slow learner. <laughs> <laughs> But but it's interesting because okay so we talked a little bit about being diagnosed as a child versus being diagnosed as an adult and you were diagnosed you know thirty seven was the age you were diagnosed around I was uh, twenty seven oh sorry twenty seven I was I was twenty seven and then my birthday was in June so I turned twenty eight gotcha so you were just turning yeah. twenty eight at that time yeah I just turned twenty eight yep so at twenty eight years old I, I don't know about you but at twenty eight I thought I knew everything at that point. I knew everything yeah. that, that needs to be known, but but the question is, when you have something like this just kind of come out of nowhere, it kind of smacks you in the face. Yeah. You had no idea what you were dealing with. What did it teach you about yourself, and what did it teach you about life? To be very humble and to be open to letting people help you. Uh, I, I you know I want to be like you know I can do this all on my own. Like I I went to different I went to di- different dietitians. I went to different nutritionists just to see the difference. I was just like you know I need more information. I need more information so I can come up with a plan for myself. That's going to help me because I'm like, every time I, I try to sit down, I went to dietitian classes, diabetes classes, and it's like they bring this little plate with these plastic foods and portions. And I was just like, okay, you show me what is what, what do I, how do I make it? Like, how do I cook it? I mean, how am I, how I'm going to take this information home and take it and do it? Because all you're doing is showing me these numbers on this PowerPoint screen. It's showing me a list of paper that I'm not going to remember. I'm probably going to throw it away and lose it in my car today. And, uh, you're already boring me with your lecture because I'm just like, I'm not interested to tell me the meat and potatoes, what I need to know and how to get better. That's what I want to know. That's what I'm here for. But it was, everything was kind of just across the board, the same routine. I was just like, but I took, I took a little bit from everybody. I was like, okay, I'm a chef. Let me. All 
All right, so we had a little technical difficulty with the the, uh, the phones there, so we're back in. So we, we were talking a little bit about um, how after you were diagnosed, you kind of learned about yourself, how to be humble and how to let people kind of into your world, let them help you. Talking about learning how to uh, control, uh, understand portion sizes. We were talking about, okay, we want to get to the meat and potatoes and stuff. You want to learn how right. to cook it. You don't necessarily care about the, the details per se. You, you want to just get into it and start figuring out how to, how to make yourself healthy through food. Which, exactly. um, which leads us to <coughs> kind of your, your present day where you're combining all of these different things uh, from your background in the kitchen to your recent diagnosis with type 1, your desire to help other people. All these things are kind of coming full circle for you right now into what you're calling and your website is Sweet Science Chef, which we're going to talk about how people can get there and learn more about you. But let's talk about food uh, in general first, and then we'll kind of boil it down to some of the okay. details. Um, I, I, I think I, I, I'm, I'm really interested in food. I think a lot of people are interested in food. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but w what is, what do you think is the biggest challenge that those of us who are kind of managing diabetes every day, uh, have when it comes to food? Well, like we said earlier, you know, doing a change in something and changing the diet is very difficult for some, a lot of people where you're so used to eating fast foods and at every corner and stuff like that. One you think it's more expensive. Two, you think it's, it's hard. And then three, you want to make your food look like what you see comparing to Food Network and Chopped and all stuff like that. And the thing is, you can make yourself look like that. And that's what I try to do. I try to make, because people people eat with their eyes. And the more people can eat with their eyes, it was more satisfying to your eyes. Your brain is going to let off the endorphin. Like, you know what? That looks good. That looks tasty. But you don't really know the, the breakdown of it and how the food is going to be nutritious to you. Because I can I can make something look seem as if it's unhealthy, but it's really healthy for you. And uh, it's just it's just kind of taking it back to basis with people on just using certain foods that they. Uh, I try to cook all my meals like from grocery stores that people go through every day because how many it's it's so different when you you got a lot of you got a lot of different chefs out there that try to uh, not try to you know put anybody down, but a lot of chefs out there that just try to make. There's a lot of unhealthy food that just looks really nice, and but how many times are you going to actually go? You know what? I'm going to make this porterhouse steak with these balsamic uh, reduction and all that. So you're not going to do it. Just, just be, just be simple. People have people have five different groups they really go through. They like they like Mexican food or Spanish food. They like uh, which is American, you know, the hot dogs and the hamburgers. They love Italian, which is the pizza and the pastas. They like Asian food, and some people like you know uh, the Greek or Mediterranean. So I try to make sure I kind of work within all of those to kind of tie them all together because my favorite food is Asian food. Asian food is quick, it's tasty, and it's cheap. Now, going into a new diet, the hardest thing for people to, when they change is like, you know, where I don't, you don't feel as full, and that's going to take some, that's going to take some, you know, mental strength. To be like, you know what? I can eat six meals a day and not be starved myself. I tell people I don't eat salad ever. Like, I really don't. And my numbers are, you know, well under 200 every day. And, uh, you know, so I, I like to just show people, like, you know, uh, making simple meals like fajitas, how I can make them more nutritious. You know, finding that 100-calorie uh, tortilla with only 6 grams of net carbs in it. You make you a full, a full burrito, pretty much. Um, using, you know, instead of doing boring stuffed bell peppers, you can do, uh, even if it's a vegan dish, you can do, uh, you know, uh, spaghetti squash with the stuff with the stuff uh, uh, beyond meat uh, vegan stuff like that. I try to make it on all different levels of people who are vegan, people who uh, don't really eat a lot of meat and stuff like that. You know what I'm saying? Just make it easier. It just show people because the only thing I think that the hardest part is people getting in the kitchen, having that relationship with the kitchen, and be like, you know what? Let me make this because it's easy to make a big pasta dish because we're just cooking for the family. But it's hard to kind of separate foods or something like this. I want to make food that's good for everybody that tastes good to everybody and and as you know saying that everybody can eat and it's not like hard it's really it's interesting. Not hard to do it's really interesting because you 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 bring up something that i'm just thinking about now is that you know of course food there's a massive psychological component to how we eat what we eat how we prepare mm -hmm. our food um, right uh and sometimes the psych the psychological barriers are much harder to overcome than the traditional than the actual nutritional barriers or the the uh, so, so what you're doing in essence is you're, you're making, helping people make this transition, uh, mm -hmm. because you're not taking away the stuff that they love necessarily. Mm -hmm. you're, you're making all of these kind of f 
comfort foods because we've all become comfortable with all those different foods that, yeah. you, uh, that you mentioned is, is you're making it easy for us to kind of transition from, you know, the bad way or, or not the bad way, but the less than healthy way to prepare them right. to a healthier way to prepare those foods. <coughs> and ultimately that's going to help us transition over time. It is about these steps. It's not about just cutting, yeah. cutting stuff out of your yeah. diet. Right. Yeah. Just going, uh, just kind of just shutting everything down. That's, that's, I mean, for me, it was kind of like, I had to kick it in a high year because it was kind of like life or death, but it's, yeah. it's easy to, it's easy to do that transition because people, people like to, to tend to want to overseas and stuff because they want to feel that same type of flavor, same type of excitement when they eat food, uh, the different components, if it's crunchy, cause you know, a lot of people like to eat fried food. They like to have food, a lot of gravy and the sauces and stuff, but there are healthy sauces for you. Uh, I try to, a lot of my sauces, uh, I try to make with people because a lot of people don't eat like dry food. So like, that's why I said I like Asian food. A lot of Asian food has, they, some some of their sauces are high in sugar, but the way to kind of cut the sugar is to bring some acidity into it, which is like, you know, fresh limes, fresh lemons. That's going to cut a lot of that sugar out of the way. So in that way, you can kind of mix it a single and have that same flavor, but with a little more bite into it. Uh, using fresh herbs and stuff like that just change your whole palate because their palate has to go through a whole upgrade. Yeah. So your palate is going to change, you know, use the stuff like basil, cilantro, stuff. But we never really use that all the time because everything we're getting is fried, fried, baked, double fried. And, you know what I'm saying, just dumped to whipped cream and stuff like that. But it's it's not it's not that we we can't do that. It's just that you have to do it in a in a more healthier way. And if you tend, you know, because people are going to have slip ups, you're going to you're going to you're going to slip up and eating certain things like uh People tell me that, you know, you still eat candy. I'm like, I eat candy, but uh, I eat little bits of candy. Like, if my my, if my blood sugar is about to get low or if I'm about to, you know, go work out, I eat sweet tart. Sweet tart has one of the lowest carbs and the lowest calories. You can eat 30 pieces of sweet tarts for 60 calories, and you only got, like, 16 grams of carbs. So that's that's pretty much me taking four glucose tablets. Sure. So, you know, you kind of get that sensation, like, oh, I can still have a little bit of candy or, you know what I'm saying? It's, it's different ways of working, but you got to do the research and got to be able to be open-minded to it. Because a lot of people never had, you know what I'm saying, uh, a lot of dishes have basically have uh, some sea salt, pepper, and rosemary, in it, and it would change the whole dish. People don't like to eat veggies and stuff. You add some some, uh, some vegan butter, a little bit of sea salt, um, pepper, and some rosemary, or a little bit of uh, fresh thyme, change the whole dish. It'll make it so much more enjoyable than just dumping a whole bunch of salt in it, you know what I'm saying? Because you, really you don't even have to put salt in it. You can put lemon pepper in it or yeah. garlic pepper. So it's just it's just you're just training training your palate, upgrading it, and just you know saying, re, you know just rehabilit rehabilitating you. Like, okay, let me rehabilitate my test buds because I'm like I need to eat a little bit different and still have that flavor and still have that same texture in your mind because your mind's like you know what this tastes like this tastes like what I had before and it's going to keep you coming back to eat it again and again and again. It's kind of cool because as I'm watching you talk about how you're preparing food and all the different alternatives that that are healthier. And to help us kind of transition to this healthier diet, you're lighting up. Like this is your, this is your, your, this is your place. Like you love this stuff, which is awesome yeah. because that passion is showing through. And uh, I think that if you, if you're passionate about teaching it to us, we're gonna probably be more open to actually learn from 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 you and somebody like you. I think it's awesome that that uh, you've kind of taken on this mission um, because that's the motivation that we need sometimes is somebody who can say, yeah. it is possible. It, it's it's not it's, it's not impossible. It is completely possible to do these types of things. You just got to be mindful, and you got to kind of stay on track and don't beat yourself up when you fall off. Just get back on tomorrow. Yeah. So I think it's yeah, great. I exactly. Think it's great. So so um, a, a while back I was talking. We talked a little bit about um, uh, uh, kind of you know foods that that people prefer, right? And mm -hmm. a while back, I was talking with, I don't know if you know Elliot Gatt. Elliot is, uh, he's a type one. He's up in, in Canada. And Elliot's been type one since he was a teenager. And mm -hmm. we, he founded this company called Good Glucose. And the reason why he did that was because... I've, of, seen, I've seen him. I've heard of him. Yeah, you've heard of him before. So I, he, think, I, think, I, I think I followed him, I think. Yeah, he's making an amazing impact. He's probably one of the wow. hardest, hardest working guys that, that, that's out there right now uh, mm. in the community. So he, he talked about his reason for doing what he's doing there's he talks about the inequalities in the healthcare system how yeah healthcare in general is very very expensive diabetes testing supplies are super expensive and he basically figured out a cheaper way to get test strips to people and then also to kind of donate test strips to people in need um wow 
so I'm curious to understand the parallels between not only diabetes testing supplies and the healthcare systems, but also food inequalities. Because you talk about comfort foods, you talk about stuff that's easy to get. Like, is that a reality? Is is it? Is, are there are there uh, places where you just can't get healthy food, or is it just that we're not taught to look at the healthier options? You're not. You're not taught. Like, I'm gonna give you examples. I tell I tell a lot of my. Uh... A lot of my clients and just people in general uh, to make. I can turn from any dish you like to make that you just love, and I will recreate it and make it a lot healthier than what it is. And I usually, I usually do a lot of my shopping. I, I try to shop at places that's around everybody. Like I don't really. I shop at Whole Foods for something that's really hard to get, but I go to Farm Fresh. I go to uh, Walmart. I do a lot of shopping at Walmart. Uh, Walmart has a lot of good produce. You just gotta, you know, to make sure you're checking it. Uh, a lot of those places. Um, hold on a second. Uh, Myers or any like local food store because I try to make the list is very simple. Uh, stuff like zucchini and squash, you know, carrots and parsnips. A lot of different, a lot of different vegetables. People are kind of scared to taste. Like, what you know, what is parsnips or what is that? You know, you know, I'm I'm, I'm just used to broccoli and peppers, and onions, but you know, there's ways to transform them and. When you get them, is ways to prepare them to make them more eye appealing. Because if you go, if you, if you ever notice, if you go on the Pan Express, Pan Express is very colorful. When you look at that, when you go through and look at the line, like, oh, that looks really good. It's the way they cut that makes like Asian food looks more appealing. It's hard it's, if you're looking at really thick cut peppers. They don't, you know, they don't look that appetizing. But if you cut them a certain way, it's going to make your food look that much better. It's all about the structure and how you make your food. If you just got a big big slab of steak on there, but you like, you know, you make a nice little cuts on there. It, it helps you, it helps you as a, be stronger in the kitchen. Plus it makes you, you know what I'm saying? It makes you be more creative in the kitchen as well, because now you know, the, you know, learn the simple tools and the simple strategies to make your food look better and taste better at the same time. Sure. Cause that way it'll, it'll help you build that habit and that routine to keep you going. Sure. So, so here's a listener question. I put, I put this out on, uh, on social media, and I was kind of uh, fielding questions from some people who are, are part of kind of uh, the, the online world to see what kind of questions they were dying to ask you. Um, and this one, the, I'm going to ask you just one specific question because it kind of um, combines a lot of questions that were sent to me. But I thought that this question really kind of combined everything. So this one comes from uh, Whitney Lewis, who a lot of people might know as the happy pancreas. Whitney's pretty pretty well known in the, the type 1 community. I got her and her for it. She's really cool. So, so Whitney asks, there's two questions here. So I'll ask the first one. Since Tommy's job is to cook and create, he likely has to taste test the food he creates. Does he have a routine for managing and testing his blood sugars? In other words, is he making if he's making something sweet, does he dose before he begins to prep the food? Does he check his blood sugars constantly? So are you testing the food as you're going through and do you have to account for that in your dosing? Well, yes, yeah, the thing, because I have I have a routine of different foods that I like. So I know I already know how much doses I'm gonna have because I've already got a routine and mapped out. Now before I start cooking, if I'm cooking for somebody else, I would I would dose before. Because I know I'm, I'm cooking the same thing I'm cooking for them that I would cook for myself. And I understand the ratio of what I need to take before. So I usually stick myself about four to six times a day. Uh, once I get up in the morning, you know, I get up, I get some uh, uh, sparkling water, and then I'll just myself, and I go to the gym and you know, go by my routine, then I have my first meal and stuff like that. So every time, every time I get ready to create different foods, I'll, I would dose before, especially if I'm tasting something that, that could be particularly sweet. But if I'm tasting something that's sweet, I, I don't just take a whole cup full. You know, I take a I take a tasting spoon and taste it and make sure. Because I usually like I, a lot of my sauces are kind of honey based. Uh, I use like organic honey and stuff like that, and then you dilute it with the with the lemon. Because that lemon and lime is going to help reduce some of that sugar intake. It's going to lighten it up, so that way you're not just getting full full of sugar, but you still have some of that taste, and you still can have some of that sauce on your food. That's going to make you be like, you know what, this is this is okay, this is good. You know, even if you're using a, even if you're making something that's barbecue based, you know, saying you do you do the dry dry roast, which don't have any carbs in it, and you make a nice little tomato base, add a little bit of honey, a little Worcestershire sauce, mix it up, some onions, some garlic, and you glaze it. It's not it's, it's just not over portioning everything. Sure. Because every everybody that's diabetic can eat the same food that everybody else is eating. It's just that we had to we had to monitor more of the portion and the ratio of how we eat it. We can't eat we can't eat a whole platter of food like everybody else can, but we can eat it in portions. 
it's just that you might have to intake, you might have to take take on a little bit more insulin and monitor your monitor your blood sugar. That's all. I think the reality is that most people should be eating the portion size that we, as 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 someone who is managing right. diabetes, should eat anyway. Because if you yeah, take exactly. a look at the the massive uh, growth in type two diabetes in this country and around the world, it's, it's crazy. It's specifically and it's directly related to the stuff that we're putting in our mouth every single day. So we don't um, even see it. Don't even see it because it's happening so slowly over the course of time. And then the next thing you know, you've got everybody taking pills and, and on insulin and yep. neuropathy and all the horrible things that come along with poor control when it yeah. really all starts with how we, what we're putting in our mouths every single day. So Exactly. And when you, like you say, you're, so, you're such in a habit of eating certain foods because, one, you're going to shop somewhere that's going to be convenient. Two, you're going to shop somewhere you can afford. And two, you're going to shop somewhere that has credibility to you. So if you put all those things in, in, in together – Let's okay. We got somewhere we're going to shop at. We know we know our budget, and now we know how to flavor our food. Let's go ahead and transform this. And that's and that's all it takes. To just take that first step forward and like you know, let me try let me try this. Let me let me try this taste because everybody has different taste palettes. Some people like more spicier foods. Some people like me a little bit more saltier foods. So it's just all about adjusting to what you like and then just planning out how you're going to eat. Even if you're going out to eat, if you're passing somewhere, like if I go to Wendy's right now, if I wanted to get a if I wanted to get a cheeseburger or something, I would get it. I would get it a, a naked, a naked burger, no bun, barely have any carbs in it. You know what I'm saying? Let me get one slice of cheese instead of two, because you gotta, you gotta look at what they eat. Now it might seem a little extra, you know. Hey, can you put? Because when they, when they do that, they gotta, they have to put their ketchup and mayonnaise to the side. They have to do that. It's just part of how they make their food. All those, all those little things you have to know, especially if you like to go eat out. Because I eat at fast food restaurants all the time. Sometimes you don't have. You might forget your, you might forget your meal plan. You might forget. Uh, you might be on the road traveling and stuff like that. Like all that stuff happens. But if you if you know different places you go to, and you like to eat certain things, you can do that. It's, you don't always have to eat a salad. You don't always have to eat something boring. You can eat you can eat some of the same stuff, but just a little a little bit more attention to detail of how you're going to recreate what you're going to eat from now on. <laughs> Yeah, so it's, it's all about just having the education and the knowledge, but then also having the wherewithal and the mindfulness to be able to make the decisions on the run. Um, yeah. And then it becomes habit over time, I guess. Yeah, um, and then you start knowing because you take the time to just look on their nutrition menu, then you know exactly how many carbs it is if you do it this way. Yeah. And then, you know, as you get better, you're like, okay, well, I know it's 36 carbs without the bun. Okay, I can do this. This is good. You know what I'm saying? You still you still feel on track, and you don't have to worry about getting the high blood sugar or drop it really too low and crash and stuff like that. So sure. So uh, I just have a couple more questions for you. And I know mm-hmm. that that, uh, that you've been super generous with your time today, um, Whitney. First of all, thanks for that question. I, I did have the other question, but Tommy already answered it for us. So, uh, so oh, you, sorry. Thanks, Whitney. <laughs> no, it's all good. It's all good. Um, so, so what inspires <laughs> what inspires you now to contribute uh, the work that you're putting out in the world? What's your biggest inspiration now? You know, I always love to cook, but being diabetic now makes me makes me just want to get up and like show so many people like it's it's more than I never thought I would love cooking so much more than I well as much as I do now because now I feel like I can see the the reason you know you can make food that tastes good oh man that was so good it was it was it was good but now I see people like who are like struggling with diabetes like you know what this is really good like you know how did you do this what does it taste like and you got people who don't have diabetes like man they, they like eating the plate. It's like, oh my God, what is this? You know, it's just three ingredients in it. You know what I'm saying? Because people like to see simplicity. Simplicity works for people. Yeah. And my my thing is like, I love I love to train people. I love to help people. I always have. And I would, you know what I'm saying? I tell people, you give me 100%, I give you 150 every time. Because, you know, so I always tell people, you know, I appreciate you and I support you. You know what I'm saying? And I, um, and that's how I like to carry any relationship with anybody. You know what I'm saying? Anytime you need you need a reference, you need you need to call me about something, you need a recipe, you're working on something. Because at work I'm training, I'm training junior sailors, junior cooks that's coming in from high school every every four weeks coming in. And I'm and I'm seeing them coming straight from school and they was like, Oh, how do I do this, petty officer? How do I cook this, this and that? And I have to be patient enough to take them, hey, I'm gonna show you how to make this and then they I I develop them and these skills. I train them and I mold them, and that's what I do every day. So it's like, it's kind of just second nature. But then when I actually get to meet people like civilian world, it's like so much more of a like a better feeling because it's like, man, I really, I really help somebody. Like I really, I can see the rewards of helping somebody. Like I change, I change their life because it's it's so hard just trying to keep up with boring food. But you eat something that excites you and you and you do it. It's like, man, I made this. Let me put it on Instagram. Like, oh, this you know. So that's I. 
I, I really just, you know, ever since I've been diabetic, it just pushed me to maybe to change how people look and view food because it doesn't have to be boring. It doesn't have to be unflavorful. So I was going to make it more of a more of an easy thing to comprehend. Sure. So if you could jump back in time and bump into a young Chef Tommy um, and you can impart one bit of knowledge to that kid, anything, anything at all, what would it be? Uh, don't stop cooking. <laughs> don't stop cooking. Okay. Don't stop cooking. Cooking, cooking kept me a lot, kept me out a lot of bad places, kept me, kept me, kept me focused, uh, kept me structured. So being in that, being in that realm, meeting those different type of people, I don't regret anything that happened because I know it is for, it's for a purpose. And my purpose is, you know, since trying to fulfill and change people's lives every day, like, you know, with food or with just talking or just, you know, saying, hey, let's, let's go to the grocery store. I'm going to show you exactly what you need to get, exactly how much you need to get. And we're going to make this meal because that's what people, some people need you to hold their hand and they, they don't, they're too prideful to say it, but man, let's, let's go to the grocery store. Let's have a grocery store tour and let you, what's, what's the good stuff you can use because a lot of stuff are so hidden. And then a lot of us are kind of like, we don't have the time or the patient to read nutrition fast and be able to, to like pinpoint different stuff that we, you know, cause a lot of different terms and stuff like that. So I try to use a lot of natural spices and a lot of natural stuff because you can see it right there and it's, it's zero all the way down. And these are natural stuff you can grow in the back of your house or on a ledge or anything. So I want to keep that, keep that, uh, you know what I'm saying? That, uh, that simplicity going because if you can, if you can spell it and then know what it is, it makes it easier for you to be like, you know, even if a kid said, Oh, that's, that's rosemary or that's, that's, uh, that's cumin or, you know what I'm saying? It's, it makes it so much easier. That just goes back to your, your grandma's garden, basically. Yeah, and, it, and it's so funny. I just be like, I remember planting these mint leaves for, just for iced tea, but it was it was so good when you got the iced tea. I was like, oh, this is the best iced tea ever. So I really appreciate it. I tell it all the time. I was like, thank you for taking me out the garden. Grandma. I pre- really appreciate it. You know, my dad had a garden when I was growing up also, and he would grow like tomatoes and cucumbers and peppers and carrots and mm-hmm. stuff. The problem was that I would go back and I would grab the, 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 the carrots out of the ground before they were fully grown, and I would wash them up. And the next thing you know, my dad's chasing me around the lawn because he's like, you have to let them grow. You have to let them grow. They were just these tiny yeah. little things, but they were really, really good. And there's nothing like pulling a vegetable out of the ground, washing mm-hmm. it off with a hose, and eating it right away. There's yeah. nothing better than that. So Seeing, seeing something that you – you created just like you just like and seeing it grow and manifest is like man I did that and it empowers you because we lost that a lot of our ways and just our education we don't we don't have a lot of those people that teach us how to grow and teach us how to make different stuff because you know a lot of unfortunately a lot of our you know great grandparents that you know passed away moving but we kind of lost that we lost that lack of knowledge and they were a lot you never really not learned it in the school unless you're trying to go to agriculture school but sure. you don't really learn it and practice it on a daily you know yeah. what I'm saying. Because you only need a little bit of space to kind of just practice and refine your skills on growing and stuff like that. So, yeah, we're spoiled. We get everything from the supermarket. Yeah, because we, we, we get everything instant. You know, we can order from my phone. I want, I want some carrots, and zucchini, and tomatoes. You know, tomorrow I'll Uber Eats, send it on the way. So That's right. It's delivered it's, to our front door. We don't even know where it comes from. Exactly. You don't even know. You don't. You don't have that. You don't. Like I said, we lost our relationship with food, and it's kind of like we don't. We don't have that same vibe with it anymore. It's everything's just so. I want it right now. I don't care where it came from. Just give it to me. You know, wow. I want everything so instant. Well, hopefully, with the work that you're doing, we're going to get back to that kind of passion for food and that mindful, mindful eating as well. Um, on for your web- sure, for on, sure. On your website, you've got a lot of information. I'm going to have links to everything in the notes for this particular episode. You not only have information, you have uh, ways that people can get in touch with you on there. You also have, as you said, you can go on on supermarket tours to understand. Uh, what foods might be healthy and easy to get. Um, you also do training uh, for people uh, and you're a personal chef. So there's a yeah. lot a lot of stuff that you're offering people out there to learn to how, how to eat healthier uh, and eat to live, basically, as you say on your website. Yeah. Um, so we'll, yeah, we'll put sir. all that up on there. But where's the best place where everybody can get in touch with you online? What's the uh, what's your social media stuff? Uh, uh, they can hit, um, I check my Instagram pretty, pretty much all the time. Uh, Sweet Science Chef uh, on Instagram, and uh, if you want to email me, you know, what I'm saying if you want to talk, if you got questions, um, very very open, very transparent person. I'm always you know here to help. Uh, my email is uh, chef uh, science at sweetsciencechef.com. Uh, just feel free to hit me up if you got questions. Uh, if you know, what I'm saying you're trying to try something new, just you know, ask me. I'm here to help. Uh, 
yeah that's you know basically it that's great I'll, those two all the time. I'll have i'll have that up on the show notes as well so last question for you um mm-hmm. so you invested over 10 years of your life in the military right mm-hmm uh, surrounded by some of the most courageous men and women out there, you actually fed them, which is probably one of the more noble jobs, I would guess, on the ship <laughs> is you keeping these people healthy um, yeah. so they can do their work every single day. So I'm interested in, in, in understanding what your definition of the word brave is. My, my, defini- my definition of the word brave is uh, it kind of ties in with just integrity, just having doing, doing, doing the right thing when nobody's watching. Because bravery is not something that everyone has to see. Waking up out of bed, injecting yourself, you know, taking your blood sugar and stuff, that's bravery right there. You know, not saying, you know, I don't I don't want that cheesecake today. That's that takes bravery. Uh not eating this bag of Skittles, that takes bravery. Every every little thing you do in life takes that type of bravery and takes that, that courageousness to be able to do it day in and day out. Because a lot of a lot of small victories are you know what I'm saying, are are, sh- I mean, are not shown and not visible. So for people to have, for me, for just having that type of bravery is just, you know what I'm saying, doing doing, doing it without even nobody's, you know what I'm saying, um, uh, having over like, oh, you know, you did that? Oh, okay, cool. You know, just just do it. Just do it because you do it. You know, you want to do it. And you know what I'm saying? You don't have to prove to anybody. Awesome. So Chef Tommy, Thank you so much for uh, thank for you. The time. Thank you. No, it's my pleasure. I learned a lot from you today, and, and I love the fact that you're, you're, you know, look, I I have conversations with everybody on all ends of the spectrum in terms of nutrition and diet, you know, uh, raw vegan. There's paleo, all that stuff yeah. out there, which I have a lot of respect for everybody, and I experiment with a lot of different diets. But especially for someone who is just kind of transitioning or just trying to figure this whole diabetes thing out. The they just need somewhere to start. That's it. You got to start somewhere. So, yep. so you're definitely in that kind of world where you're helping people transition to leading a healthier life and having a healthier relationship <laughs> with food. So I appreciate you greatly, and I can't thank you enough for sharing your knowledge and and I look forward to kind of seeing where you go uh, with with all of your your efforts and your work and uh, how everybody's going to gain from just the information that you're imparting. So thank you so much, and I look forward to talking to you again soon. All right, thank you, man. Appreciate it. Cool. Hold on one second because I want to talk to you a little bit after we hit we hit stop here, okay? Okay, cool. Cool. Thanks, man. All right, guys. I hope you guys got a lot out of that conversation with Chef Tommy. I definitely encourage you to check out his website and his social media accounts for more information and tips on how he prepares healthy foods that are affordable and also enjoyable. I'll have links to Sweet Science Chef and everything Chef Tommy and I talked about in this episode of the show on the website at thebravestlife.com forward slash 033. And one final piece of business for this week. Again, I want to thank all of you who have been kind enough to leave a positive review on iTunes. When you do things like that and when you share your thoughts about the show on iTunes, it makes it a whole lot easier for the world to find us. So if you haven't already done so, and if you like the show, please consider heading over to iTunes to leave your own review. It takes just a minute or two, so please let the world know what you think of the show over on iTunes. All right, guys, thanks again for joining me this week. I'm Craig, and I will see you next week with an episode that is very, very special to me. We'll be talking with a colonel in the U.S. Army about things like mindset and perseverance. Do yourself a favor. Do not miss that episode. All right, guys, take care. I'll see you next week.